Hey everybody, Adam in my cave. Uh, today we are maturing some animatronics. Sharp-eyed viewers from a long time ago will remember a raptor costume that was uh, started here in the cave and never finished. That is being remedied now. Uh, and I've got this beautiful sculpt from Gary Staub of a, of a raptor that he sculpted in his incredible shop in Kansas City. And uh, I need to make the jaw activate. I've got the jaw properly pivoted. I've built the pivot for the jaw back here, but now I need to activate it. And this here is the uh, activation module for my raptor costume. The operator sits back in the center of the chest, operating these controls, which give the head its back and forth, up and down, and some very wonderful, this like trio of universal joints provides a, a terrific amount of character animation. But speaking of character animation, there's one part that I need to do, which is to activate this jaw here, and I need to be able to activate it from back here. So, The most, oh wee, hey, woo. I am coming to the natural lifespan of lock line when you abuse it as much as I do for my cam camera stands. Anyway, but um, animatronics is about action at a distance. Action at a distance, not spooky action at a distance. That's quantum mechanics. Animatronics is often, I'm just trying to think of a way to frame this in the most basic way. I think I'm overthinking it. Um, we all use the basic uh, building block of modern animatronics uh, every day when we ride our bicycle because our bicycles often have cables for braking. And when you brake here, you are activating a lever force on a piece of braided steel cable. This is some very nice braided steel cable, which is called swaged because it's got a it's been rolled, it has a very smooth outside edge, and that means it. So you pull on a piece of braided steel cable, and the piece of braided steel cable is connected to you by a lever, and it's connected at the other end by a lever, and in the middle is a tube that holds those two levers uh, in tension with each other. So when you activate one, you activate the other. You pull on the brakes, you pull on the brakes here, er, and this clamps down on your wheel. I am building nothing more complicated than that. Uh, but I need it to be strong enough so that when you do this with your hand, the whole jaw of my raptor opens and closes. So I'm gonna try and give a little bit of a mechanical advantage in there. And for my cable housing, I'm gonna be using a very, very, very lightweight cable housing. It's this stuff. It's very, very, it's insanely small. Hold on, I'll tell you how small. I will tell you. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, we have here my millimeter micrometer, and we can tell you that this is Oh right. Okay. So this is um it's about two millimeter in outer diameter with a one millimeter inner diameter, and through it I'm going to be running this um, 100 pound half millimeter fishing line. Um, this is a recommendation from my friends in the effects industry. Um, when I was first starting out in animatronics, I was using the cable that would come with Golden Boy, which is like this 0.8 millimeter wire. Um, but they tell me that now they use the fishing line because it's like 100 pound test and gives us softer response. <clears throat> So I'm gonna muck with that today. I've got plenty of the housing. Uh, I may wanna also activate the eyes or I may want those to be electromechanical. We shall see, that is a decision I will make later. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna make a, a system of the brake lever and the brake pad. I'm gonna make that system. Uh, a pair of mechanical arrangements with two lines of ha cable housing in between and a cable running between them, push, pull, so that, so that I can activate the jaw remotely. 
That's my that's my that's my science communication helpful uh, activating remotely. Um, okay.
All right, that's good. Total disaster. That didn't work at all. Like, uh, not even a little bit.
Oh, okay. It worked a little bit. I don't know what I mean. Okay. Um, this video will not end with a successful jaw for my dino. Um, and let's talk about how we got here and where I'm going to go from here and what's going on. Uh, to go back to the very beginning, I'm attempting to get my dinosaur to talk and I want to control that talking, that jaw movement from my position back in her midsection. And I built these two wheels to do that with cabling and failed utterly. And I'm gonna talk about Adam Sandler and basketball before we're done because this is a really important lesson to get about skill bases or skill about skills in general. Okay, uh, just to describe how this mechanism, how I'm planning for it to work, how I was planning for it to work is um, this was the, this is a, a pulley on the jaw and this is a pulley where I'm activating. And the reason the activation pulley is bigger is because I was hoping to transfer a little more movement to the, to the jaw mechanism, right? Because I get a longer lever arm out of it than this one. And the goal was that there'd be a, a cable running basically all the way around the system. It's called a push-pull system. So I push here and it pulls there and vice versa. That is as opposed to a spring return system where you just pull a cable and a spring brings it back to home position. Um, those are much more difficult mechanisms in my opinion, so I like the push-pull. However, in this push-pull that I've designed, my cable housings are collapsing. And imagine if your bicycle cables were made out of drinking straws, the housing on your bicycle cables. When you push, pulled on your, your bike brake lever, those drinking straws would collapse because of the force of the cable on them. That's what's happening here. I, I haven't built enough robustness into this system. In fact, I'm, I'm failing on all the fronts of animatronics. I'm not communicating enough movement to the jaw with enough sensitivity, it's not easy <laughs> and it's not very repeatable. The system gets worn out very quickly. Uh, and I think this is all because of uh, my limitations as an animatronics designer. As a generalist, I am always saying I'm mediocre at most of the skills I have, that my talent, if you want to call it that, exists in combining those skills those media, <laughs> combining all that mediocrity to achieve something great. <laughs> I know that's a funny way to say it, but it really is sometimes how I feel that I execute my projects. But there are some skills that are really difficult to be mediocre at. Okay, so I wanna talk about Adam Sandler for just a second. Adam Sandler is famous for showing up in random cities he's visiting and playing pickup basketball games. And I love this about him. I love people that have radical skills in different areas that you don't expect. And so Sandler shows up in these games and by all accounts from people that have played with him, he is a really great pickup basketball player. Uh, and the way they describe it is he has a court sense, um, a level of proprioception about where he is on the court, where the basket is, and where his other teammates are, that from my reading is something you only keep up by playing all the time that that court sense is not something that you just have. It is not something totally innate, that it is more something that you keep up by constantly playing. And I recognize that as a difference in some skills. Some skills you could sort of like, oh, okay, yeah, I know a little bit about how to join two pieces of wood together so I can make a wood joint that is as good as anybody's wood joint. But with animatronics, I think of animatronics as very much like that, that, that court sense in basketball. I have done and worked on and built and designed animatronics in pieces here and there for 30 years. And over that time, what I have come to understand is I'm not great at animatronics. It's not one of my core skills. Uh, and that the somehow in my brain, the transfer of power through lever arms is something that uh, I'm really good at problem solving at a very simple level, but when it gets to some uh, extra levels of complexity, I have to admit that I don't do it often enough to have the chops to execute to the level that I want. And this is the kind of knowledge that you get after years of working with yourself. I mean, look, bidding a job is basically figuring out how much stamina and energy you have to finish something in a period of time so that you can make some money. Um, and 
you can only do that well if you know exactly how long it's going to take you to execute something and then you get paid for those hours. Um, and it's very difficult to know how long something is going to take. And we've all done jobs where we bid it out and thought it was 30 hours and it ended up being 100 hours. And by contrast, there are jobs that I've bid out that I thought would take 40 hours that took 10 and I made tons of dough for my time. <sighs> But part of knowing yourself is knowing when you need help. And that's where I'm at with this. Uh, if I'm going to make my dyno have a real moving jaw that I can operate that is robust, <clears throat> I need help. I need expertise. Uh, and I've called a friend of mine who's going to come up from Los Angeles and spend a couple of days helping to execute this jaw mechanism with me. Uh, that will be in a separate video. Uh, okay. Before I wrap this, I want to go back and say this one thing. Um, really, really, really early in my life, in my professional life, at the age of like 20 in New York City in 1987, I took on a job uh, to work on a student film and I did not know what I did not know. And that was the most egregious example of how much damage one can cause when one does not know what one does not know. I took on this job to make an ATM vestibule and an ATM for the student film. And I, it's a much longer and depressing story, but I ended up in the last four days not sleeping for like 60 hours. The whole crew showed up expecting to film on the set that I had promised would be done and it wasn't. They pulled like three all-nighters to get the film across the line and then I missed the loadout. I was, this is one of my lowest points in my professional life. And there was this moment in that where I felt lower than I had ever felt and I was super depressed and super sad and I was crying and I called my dad and I said, uh, I don't know how to make this right. My friends are so mad at me. I really screwed up. I don't know how to make this right. And my dad said, you can't apologize your way out of it. You, your apology doesn't mean anything, right? Because you've done this thing. Uh, you can't undo the thing you did. He said, the only power you have right now over your future is to make sure that you don't do that again. That's what you can promise to yourself, uh, is that you will take care of the circumstances that led to this and make sure they don't happen again. And that's a great lesson. I'm really grateful he gave that to me in that moment because it was very clear. Um, and a few months later, a really exciting opportunity came to me from like a, a, a guy in Hollywood who was like working on his first film and it was very exciting and he wanted me to do the special effects for it. And when I looked at it and his budget, I realized uh, he didn't have enough. I, I needed help for this job and he was hoping for a one-stop shop. And when I said I wouldn't be able to execute his job alone, he went with someone else. Now, in one sense, I lost that job. But in another sense, I dodged another bullet. I dodged the bullet of me taking on a job I was not qualified to execute. And I think some of the most important jobs in our lives are the jobs we don't take or we turn down or we leave. There's so many lessons in those three categories. Uh, I know I feel like I'm tying the whole, my whole history and the world into this, but frankly, knowing the limits of your skill and knowing when to ask for help is one of the most vital skills to develop as a maker and a collaborator with other people. Um, and it's an imperfect science. We all get it wrong all the time. The whole idea of a one day build lasting longer than a day is like a hug to this idea. So that's where we're ending this. I don't have a jaw yet, but I have a plan and the plan involves help. Thanks for joining me. I will see you guys next time. Thank you guys so much for watching that video. We have some brand new merch available at the store. A dog's age ago, I mean like 2018, 2019, this wonderful graphic designer named Brian Otterer reached out to us and sent us some stickers. He has a design firm called Dash Three Dots and we loved his stickers so much we wanted to sell them on the merch store. Well, he updated them with our new logo and we've got 
Adam in the Martian space suit sticker. We've got Adam in the shuttle suit sticker. We've got Adam in the Apollo suit sticker. And my personal favorite, Adam in the alien space suit sticker. Get yours now, tested-store.com. Hey! 